The ADS CFT duality. And he sits space um, is a maximally symmetric solution the, to Einstein's equations um, of the negative cosmological constant. The, um, string theory the the is like a Pringle, but not really. Since of the holographic um, principle, the ADS CFT correspondence. Um, M theory and ADS four cross S7. What is ADS? Um, theory, ADS is pain. Everyone's always going on about how great anti de Sitter space is, but we don't even have any real-world examples of ADS. If only there was some space-time that we could study that was more physical. Why is everyone so anti de Sitter space? Great question. De Sitter space is so much more physical. It actually, at least asymptotically, describes our universe, after all. Shall we do a project on de Sitter space instead? Yeah, let's do a project on the sitter. That makes so much more sense. They might get suspicious, so let's work in three dimensions. Well, it's close enough to four. There are many motivations for studying the sitter. Some of these stem from observations that have been made in the last 20 years. For example, measurements of supernovae have shown that the current value of the cosmological constant in our universe is small but positive. We've also seen from observations of the CMB that the early universe was dominated to first approximation by a positive cosmological constant. So this tells us that the universe has had two periods of accelerated expansion in its history, with the first early period having a much faster expansion than the one we see today. And de Sitter is a solution to Einstein's equations that has such a positive cosmological constant and so describes an expanding universe. And therefore it's a very physically interesting space time to study as well as being very theoretically interesting because it allows us to ask questions about, for example, the nature of horizons that aren't necessarily those uh, of black holes. So I'll start with a description of the geometry of the sitter in three dimensions. Uh, the reason for restricting to three dimensions, I'll explain a little bit later. Um, but in a similar way to ADS, we have an embedding space picture of the sitter, which is described by this equation, where this L squared is the de Sitter radius. And uh, this is embedded in flat space of one higher dimension, so in uh, R1, 3. And uh, this hyperboloid looks something like this. So um, constant time slices here in this hyperboloid look like two spheres. So we've got a time direction, which is x naught going upwards here. And uh, each constant slice is a two sphere. So the, these two spheres start at infinite radius, they shrink down to the de Sitter radius, and then they grow again to infinite radius in the far future. Now we can pick some specific coordinates to describe this hypersurface, such as these ones, for example. And we can use these to write a uh, metric by uh, plugging them into the flat space metric, which looks like this. So it's minus dt squared plus cosh squared t uh, d omega squared, where d omega squared is the round metric on the two sphere. So we can see immediately from this description what I was just saying, which is that constant time slices uh, give us the metric on the two sphere. So we can also look at what happens if we whip rotate uh, the sitter space. So we want to describe it in Euclidean signature. And uh, if we do that, so in the embedding space picture, this means uh, taking this x naught coordinate to be minus i x naught. And then we uh, immediately get the uh, equation of a three sphere if we do that, as we can see. And uh, we can do a similar thing in the metric description of the global de Sitter, which is if we take uh, this capital T to minus IT, we also get the round metric on the three sphere. So that's a nice sanity check. And so we can see that Euclidean de Sitter physics is in three dimensions is described by the three sphere. The Penrose diagram of de Sitter is a square that looks like this. And as we just noted, constant time slices in this space are two spheres. So the left and right hand side of this Penrose diagram are not actually boundaries of the space. They're really poles of the two, two sphere. And we can focus on one specific coordinate patch of de Sitter, which is this one here, and it's called the static patch. And it has a metric which uh, is described like this. It's the metric that's associated to an inertial observer that sits at one of the poles of the two sphere. And uh, this observer will always see a horizon in the space, as we can see from the Penrose diagram, at the place where this coordinate rho equals pi over 2. 
And this horizon is caused by the expansion of the space-time itself. It's caused by the fact that light is going to take increasingly long to reach us uh, because it's trying to overcome the expansion of the space. And we can also wick rotate this metric taking t to minus i t. And of course, we lose this minus sign here. And uh, in different coordinates, this is also the round metric on the three sphere, which seems strange because uh, the static patch is only covering one portion of the global space time, but they're both described by the three sphere in Euclidean signature. And we can also take constant time slices in this static patch metric. And of course, we then lose this dt squared piece and we're left with the topology of a disk. And that tells us that we can think of the static patch into Sitta as being like a disk evolving in time or like a disk times the real line. So to summarize, from a Lorenzian perspective, global de Sitter can be described as a two sphere times the real line and its static patch can be described as a disk times the real line. But from a Euclidean perspective, both of these objects are described as a three sphere. So the idea is that we want to put some theory on the disk times the real line and the same theory on the three sphere to see if we can find some relationship between the Euclidean physics and the Lorentzian physics of the static patch in De Sitter. So this brings us on to why we're doing all of this in three dimensions in the first place. And that's because we'd like to exploit some of the properties of chern simons theory, which is a three dimensional the field theory that looks like this. It's got a coupling constant K that's called the level and it's over a three-dimensional manifold M. There are a couple of reasons why Chern-Simons theory is useful to us. Uh, the first is that it's a topological quantum field theory, which means that it only depends on the manifold M that we put it on. Secondly, it's got a very close relationship with 3D gravity. Um, they're actually equivalent, at least in a semi-classical sense, which is very useful for us. And lastly, there are already many known results for chern simons theory on compact manifolds, uh, such as some very important results by Witten in the 80s, which showed that the partition function for chern simons theory on the three sphere could be fully classified for any choice of the gauge group. Uh, so this is nice for us because it means that, in a sense, half the work is already done. Uh, our Euclidean de Sitter calculations can be covered by the three sphere partition function. So let's first just look at a very simple example where the gauge group is just U1 at coupling constant K. So we're just looking at a very simple abelian theory. And uh, Witten tells us that the partition function of, over the three sphere takes this form of one over root K. From this, we can immediately calculate the entropy by taking the log of this partition function, which looks like this. So uh, that's the calculation on the three sphere done. And we can do the same thing on the disk times the real line to do the static patch calculation. In the case where Chern Simons theory is put on a manifold with a boundary, we get an edge mode theory induced on that boundary. And in this case, it's the theory of a compact chiral boson. Uh, chiral in the sense that it's only traveling in one direction around this disk boundary. So we can calculate the partition function of this edge theory, and uh, we can then take the high temperature limit of it, which is the same as putting the edge mode degrees of freedom to be very close to the de Sitter horizon or the edge of the disk. And we can immediately calculate the entropy again, which takes this form where upsilon is the velocity of the excitation that goes around the boundary. And what we notice is that even though we've done very different calculations on totally different manifolds, we've got this same minus a half log k term in both cases. And it's not obvious why we should get the same uh, contribution to the entropy in both of these situations unless we put this in the context of the sitter. So we've shown even in this very, very simple abelian case that the uh, three sphere partition function has an equivalence with the high temperature limit of the edge mode theory partition function. And when we give this the context of saying that, well, we're doing a Euclidean de Sitter calculation on the one hand and the Lorenzian de Sitter calculation of the static patch on the other hand, it makes sense that we should get the same contribution to the entropy. Now, this uh, minus a half log K term was also found in some papers by Katav and Preskill and Levin and Wen, and they called it a topological entanglement entropy. And this begs the question for us, if this is an entanglement entropy, what is being entangled? 
so as I mentioned earlier, we have this global picture of De Sitter as being in like a two sphere evolving in time. Uh, what I didn't mention was that in three dimensions, the horizon is just a circle in De Sitter, which we can imagine sort of slicing this two sphere in half like this. And so uh, what we really have here is two uh, two dimensional hemispheres that are separated by a S1 horizon. And uh, these are still disks, because we can imagine at least topologically deforming them to be disks, which matches up with our description of the static patch as a disk evolving in time. So maybe there's a sense in which there's some entanglement between the two static patches across the horizon. And we need to think about forming a reduced density matrix by tracing out the degrees of freedom behind the horizon that we don't have access to. So now we come back to something that I mentioned earlier, which is that semi-classically, Chern-Simons theory is equivalent to 3D gravity. And that works by taking our total action to be two copies of Chern-Simons terms, where uh, each one has a gauge field A plus and the other one has a gauge field A minus, where this gauge field is a linear combination of the spin connection and the dry bind in tetrad formalism, uh, where we divide by this uh, de Sitter length, de Sitter radius L. So the choice of the gauge group is what gives us the theory of gravity that we're in. And the relevant ones for De Sitter are if we want a Lorentzian signature, the gauge group is SL2C, which at the Lie algebra level is equivalent to complexified SU2. Or if we want Euclidean signature, the gauge group that we need to choose is uh, two copies of SU2. So the idea is that we'd like to put this SL2C theory on the disk times the real line and the two copies of SU2 theory on the three sphere and see if we can find some relationship between the partition functions of the two. But this isn't very easy to do for the full non-abelian case. So we start with a simpler toy model, which is to take abelian gauge fields. So for the disk, we take instead a complexified U1 instead of a complexified SU2. And then the gauge field has this form uh, where A and B are themselves real gauge fields in the Lie algebra of U1. The action then takes this form uh, where we have a generally complex coupling constant, which isn't strictly necessary for the 3D gravity case, but it keeps everything as general as possible, which is nice. Uh, this A that I'm writing is the curly A that lives in the complexified U1. Uh, it's, I just didn't write it very well. And we lose the A wedge A wedge A term because the, this theory is abelian. So when we go through the process, uh, we find that the edge mode theory that lives on the boundary of the disk is a conformal quantum mechanics problem. But we have a problem, which is that uh, we find that the Hamiltonian of this theory is unbounded from below, which means that we can't calculate the partition function in the same way as we did for the very simple U1 case that we did uh, first of all, because in that case, we uh, used trace e to the minus beta h uh, to calculate the partition function. So we can also look at uh, what happens on the three sphere. Uh, so in this case, the gauge group we want to mimic is SU2 cross SU2. So we do U1 cross U1. And we find the partition function is of the form uh, 1 over root k squared plus lambda squared coming from the coupling constant. And as a nice sanity check, if we, get, uh, if we put lambda equals 0 in this, we do get two copies of the result that we got for the, uh, in the abelian example that we did first, U1 cross U1. So this theory no longer suffers from being unbounded from below, which is nice, but unfortunately it is not unitary. So we have to uh, sort of pick our poison between these two. So we'd like to find some relationship between these two results that we've gotten. So uh, on the one hand, we have this Lorentzian edge mode theory that has a complexified U1 gauge group that's living on the boundary of a disk. So it's living on S1 cross R. And we want to compare it to this Euclidean Chern-Simons theory that we've put on the three sphere that has gauge group U1 cross U1. One way we could think about going about that would be to maybe wick rotate this edge mode theory um, so that we end up with now obviously a Euclidean signature edge mode theory. But importantly, this still has the gauge group complexified U1. But now because we've periodically identified the tau coordinate, this is living on the torus. And we could see what happens if we compare this to the U1 cross U1 Euclidean theory on the torus. And what we see is that uh, if we complexify the contour of integration in the complexified U1 theory uh, in the path integral, we have an equ equivalent description between these two. We can find a map between these two descriptions. So we have successfully found a link between these two uh, descriptions of De Sitter. Thanks very much for watching.